I don't know how you feel about that. Trustworthy and true. 2017 has taught us that uh, not everything is trustworthy and true, no? So, you don't know about fake news yet? <laughs> In fact, I have a friend, uh, shout out to, to my friend, uh, the pastor of the Simi Valley Church. He's doing an entire series that will stretch into March that has to do with truth and fake truth. Very interesting series. I might steal it from him and bestow it upon you someday. These are trustworthy words that you can take home with you today. God thinks you are worth it. I believe fully at this very moment that Jesus stayed around and he went through the cross situation because he said no to the devil. He said, no, these guys are worth it. I believe that's why he was sweating blood. Because the devil was tempting him saying, you know what, everything that you've done, it's for nothing. Look at these guys over here. You asked them to stay awake with you for just a little while and pray with you. They're asleep. They don't even know about your kingdom. They don't even care about your father. You have come for nothing. Jesus had to have faith at that moment, had to have the same kind of faith that he's asking you and I to have right now at the beginning of 2018. After the year that we have had in 2017, where we are not sure of the things that we have always been sure of, the last bit of opportunity for us to say we believe has been kicked out from underneath us. And yet, Jesus is saying these words are trustworthy and true. I don't know about you, but I need that. I need that in a huge way. As I move forward into 2018, I need something I can trust. I need something in my life that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt is true. So that's why I picked that text. Revelation 21 sees the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven. It's, it's beautiful. It's adorned as a bride for her husband. Now, I'm very happy to tell you that my daughter and my son-in-law are here. I will not make them stand because they will never forgive me. But they are here and, and they, you know, had pictures taken in the almost, was it almost a thousand, Kayla? Uh, her photographer, your photographer took almost a thousand, uh, three thousand. Okay, 700 or so. I, I can't stop looking at them because it's so amazing. It's, it's, it's the reality that is pictured in this moment where the, the bride of Christ, the new Jerusalem, is coming out of heaven. And if, you, if you go with the chronology that I like, uh, you can go with whatever chronology you like. This is this is after the thousand years have happened in chapter twenty, and now those that have have been resurrected at the first resurrection, and those who have been taken to heaven in the second coming, those who were alive, those who were dead, they are all together, and they are the dwelling place of the Most High God, known in cryptic terms as the new Jerusalem. Cities are always people. Let's remember that as we think of our own city, the city of angels, Los Angeles. It is always the people that make up the city. It was for people that Jesus came to be a people, to be a person on earth, God with us, that he then turns around and in Revelation 21 invites us to be his people, to be his indwelling place. Just as he hoped it would be in the Sinai Peninsula 
as the Israelites were walking around and the tabernacle was in the midst. But it's going to be 2018 shortly. 2,018 years Annus Domini after Christ. After the Lord. The year of our Lord. Annus Domini. The year of our Lord. It's what we say every year. May this be the year of our Lord. What are we hoping for? Well, we're hoping for that second advent. So this year that we have five Sabbaths in December, we have the opportunity to decide to, you know, do we do an extra Christmas Sabbath or do we let this Sabbath be the one in which we anticipate that, you know, what's happening in a day or two here with New Year. So we went with New Year. So welcome to New Year's Sabbath at Santa Clarita, where we, we anticipate because of what has already happened, because of the advent, the first one, we sit here, we, we feel the pressure of anticipation for the second advent. And I don't know about you, but of course that, that brings a rush of pride, which I should probably tamp down for being an Adventist. <coughs> what, will it, what will it be like? We're going to find out in just a, a few short hours. What would it be like to be somebody living in 2018? My son and I watched a, an old movie this week. And the future described in that movie was 2019. <laughs> you know, we're living the future. We really are. As far as the movie industry goes, we're, we're, we, we should be having flying cars by now. So this is also, this is also a time as we, as we think of the new Jerusalem, as we think of new stuff we need to have maybe a little life review. Three things that, that I'm hoping will be helpful as you review your life and as you plan your trajectory into 2018. I believe we need a new perspective. Uh, my daughter bought some sunglasses this week. She was so pleased that her husband liked them. But you see, when you put those sunglasses on, you no longer see the way that you did before. The sun no longer hits your eyes the way that it did because you put on spectacles. Those of you who wear glasses, you know what I'm talking about. Without your glasses, you see very, very differently. Without your contacts, you see, some of you even decided to get LASIK surgery so that you could have a different perspective. So we need a different perspective. Secondly, we need a new attitude. When I'm thinking about attitude, I'm thinking about relationships. Relation, I, I move in relationship to what is around me, and my attitude is me in relationship to what is around me. Now, if you're a pilot, like, congratulations to Mr. Cardi. Son became an instructor. He's going to help other people to learn to fly. Trevor is, Trevor is very pleased with himself. But if you ask him what the word attitude means to a pilot, he'll tell you about the, the things, the, the flaps, you know, because depending on their attitude determines their altitude. You've seen those signs. Attitude determines, depending on the way the flaps are adjusted means you're either going up or you're going down. So I say we need a new attitude. And thirdly, I say we need new resolve. 
new commitment, new, new resolve. See, because there are, there are certain sayings that I, I just want to review with us in the context of new, new, new. What is this business with always new? Why, why is old bad and new is good? Did you, did you buy that philosophy this Christmas? Or did you say, you know what? Uh, that shirt and tie is going to be good for another year. Not going to buy you a new one. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Always new, never old. Have you thought about this? It's something that's thrust upon us in our culture today. Uh, it goes along with the other one I like. Out with the old and in with the new. We think of that when it comes to politics. And maybe there are some of us that really, really believe that that should be true uh, currently. Out with the old, in with the new. Do we believe that? What about this one? More, more, more. Oh, you don't, you don't feel that? I have to look at myself in the mirror when I say that because I probably have too many shirts. I know I have too many ties. What do you have too much of? Yeah, we're just coming out of Christmas. I don't want to give you any buyer's remorse. I don't want you to say, oh man, pastor, you just made me feel bad. I just got my 15th shirt. When you really only wear three of them because they're your favorites. How about this? What do you want to conserve in 2018? What do you want to conserve? Some people like to call themselves conservatives. So I have a question for you, conservatives. What are you going to conserve in 2018? What's so important to you that you are going to keep? You're not going to give it away. You're not going to get rid of it. You're going to keep it. What are you going to conserve? If you're a conservative, you need an answer to that question as you review your life in advance of 2018. Uh, what about the liberals? Let's not leave them out. Uh, maybe, maybe I should ask the liberals, uh, what, what are you going to be liberal with? Conservatives, I can hear the conservatives saying, you're going to be liberal with someone else's money. And we say, wow, you know, we wish that our government would not be so liberal with some people. They didn't help. They didn't conserve. And so therefore, you know, why should the government be liberal with them? Isn't this always the big exchange that goes on when we talk about taxes? Conservative, liberal. How about personalizing that and saying, in 2018, what am I going to be conservative with? And what am I going to be liberal with? And then, just for good measure, look at Jesus and say, what was he conservative about? What did he conserve? And what was he liberal with? I know these are naughty questions to ask, but I'm, I'm just putting them out there for us to have our pure minds stirred up a little bit as we contemplate 2018. Lastly, what, what society? What society shall we contribute towards? We're going to be part of what gets built here in the Santa Clarita Valley as we're celebrating 30 years of this consolidation of four little towns that heretofore, 30 years ago, were all separate, you know, New Hall, Saugus, Canyon Country, Valencia, all now Santa Clarita. And everybody's going, rah, 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 Santa Clarita, 30 years. Some of you knew this place before it was Santa Clarita. What is going to be the seventh day at the Santa Clarita Seventh Day Adventist Church's contribution to the society that we find in Santa Clarita, California? What kind of society do we want? How can we help those who are not part of that society to be, to be enfranchised into the good life, the great life that we seem to enjoy most of us here in Santa Clarita in 2017, and hopefully on into the future. New. 
New is, I believe, Jesus' revision. He revisited the plan when he came to this world. He revisits the plan of salvation. And he says to the, the Pharisees who had represented what was new, thought that they were putting forward what was new. He says to them, look, guys, some of this you've got wrong. I need to revise what has been going on here. So he said, he said things like, uh, don't judge. Because that's God's job. It's not your job. He said things like, love your neighbor as yourself. And they even had the audacity to ask him, who is my neighbor? He said, this old thing is, is now new again. I'm, I'm going to revise. I'm going to give you this new revision, you could say, this 2.0 plan that had been formulated, as, as Eric mentioned, to his Sabbath school class, before the foundation of the world. Before God put anything together on this bit of rock in this solar system, he had a plan that if anything ever went wrong, this is what he would do. So it's an old plan, but Jesus came to make it new again. How about this? Uh, that's, that's, that would be a new perspective. How about this is a new attitude? The attitude uh, 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 that, that we would have would be Jesus' attitude towards our relationships. The way we position ourselves in our marriages, in our friendships in society, with people that don't look like us or smell like us or don't do things that we are used to doing. My travels this week included 6th Avenue in Los Angeles, otherwise known as Skid Row. Interesting history there in the Arts District. Interesting renovation, gentrification that is going on in the midst of the, the city that we know as the City of Angels. What do we know about that? What do we care about that? Do we even know those people? What do they look like? Do we even have some of those people right here in Santa Clarita? And are we helping them with what they need in order to enjoy the good life in this world today, right here at home? We need a change, need a new attitude maybe towards our relationships in society. How about a, a new resolve? A new resolve that, that determines the direction, you see, that we go. We resolve, you see, we make resolutions in the new year. We resolve to go in a new direction. The, uh, the Israelite people, the, the Jewish people, ring in the new year for them, which is not the same as our new year but they ring in Rosh Hashanah and they say, next year in Jerusalem. Next year in Jerusalem. Yes, our president can determine that it would be good to have Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. But currently not everybody agrees with him. But those who spiritually are attached to God and his love for a place in this world that actually that that Isaac was sacrificed or almost sacrificed. Remember that story? Mount Moriah? You know that's the place, right? That's Jerusalem. That's where Jerusalem was planted, was on top of Mount Moriah. And so you have Jerusalem having all of this meaning. And it even is in Revelation, this new Jerusalem that God will build and that he will bring to himself as a bride adorned for her husband all of these all of these thoughts you can you can package together and you can squish them into this package and say next year next year in Jerusalem that's a that's a adventist that's an adventist feeling 
We, 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 we are in anticipation. Because of the first advent, we can be in anticipation. We no longer need to be afraid to die. Even though death continues to stalk all of us in the valley of the shadow of death. We no longer need to fear it. That's a new attitude. That's a new perspective. That's a new resolve. I will not fear. Because next year in Jerusalem. Next year. Look for the Messiah. We have been as a people. We've been looking for his second coming. The There are those in the world who are still looking for his first coming as Messiah. And, and this has been going on ever since Eve thought that the Messiah would be her firstborn son, Cain. And then when he killed his brother, Abel, she realized that it was going to be Seth. Israelites have been looking forward to the Messiah, Seventh-day Adventists, and we, we have been looking forward to the second coming. But there's been disillusionment. I don't know about you, but being a lifelong Adventist, I look at, yeah, it's been over 150. What is it? 167? You do the math. 1844. Are we still, are we still embarrassed? I was interested to see what happened when we turned 150 years since our organization in the 1880s. I was interested to see what happened. And it was kind of quiet on the western, maybe even the eastern front. <laughs> Because we've been saying, Jesus is coming. I think it was only Mother Jones. If you don't know that website, you can bother if you want. But it was only Mother Jones who asked us. So, what do you think, guys? You've been saying this for 150 years. Uh, what do you think? Jesus isn't here yet. So, I don't know about you, but with numbers of other people, I think, in this world who have been looking forward to Jesus' second advent... There's, there's a sense, there's a sense that something has changed. Uh, maybe we're even tempted to, to say the things that, that have been said in scripture. My Lord delayeth his coming. I don't know, in 2017, have, have you been tempted to say that? I, I, I know, I know I have changed, how shall I say, changed my view of, of what it is that I should be looking forward to. As I said to some friends out front earlier today, now I am changing my emphasis to the fact that because Jesus came the first time and because he made it through the grave and is standing at the right hand of the Father, I have life eternal and I have it now. That's my perspective. That's my new perspective going into 2018. I'm not worried whether or not I am going to be raised from the dead or whether I'm going to walk straight into the kingdom of heaven, into episode two of my eternal life. I'm not worried about that anymore as I was a, as a kid. You know, as a kid, you were always told, you know, those who die, you know, the Lord is laying them to rest for their good. And that those who walk straight into the kingdom, those are the ones that lived a righteous life. Come on. I'm done with that attitude. I've got a new attitude. And it says, my relationship with Jesus means that I can have his abundant life now. I think that's worth talking to my friends about, don't you? I think that's worth having a smile on my, on my face. I follow Sir Richard Branson on Twitter. And that was one of the things he said about business this week. You can improve your business. If you just smile. That can be part of your New Year's resolution. I am going to improve the muscles that raise my lips up. I'm going to work on those muscles. And I'm going to do it by smiling 15 times a day. Whether I need to or not. Smile. It could be a resolution. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? 
And it can help with, with our feeling of disillusionment when we, when we need to step back and say, you know what, what we have thought would happen as a people who are oriented towards the future hasn't happened. It hasn't. <clears throat> but Jesus, Jesus has no less promised us and has no less told us that these words are true and trustworthy. So the question comes to us in number three for me, am I going to resolve again this year in 2018 to trust Jesus? While we were down in the arts district, we saw an art exhibition that was entitled Candor, K-A-N-D-O-R, dot con. It's worth seeing. It's worth pondering. But both Chris and I came away from that piece of art, I think, with the same impression, and that is that this is either throwing up in the face of God the idea that what you said would happen hasn't happened, and so therefore you're, a, you're just a con artist, or maybe it was saying it to the government of the United States or the governments of the world. You put forward projects that you want us to pay with our taxes and, and then you don't ever deliver. So there's this, there's this general feeling of disillusionment that we are going to have to face in 2018. And I've, I've resolved. I, I, I want you to know maybe I'm, I'm a little ahead of this process because I've been thinking about it for a while, but I'm inviting you to also think about it. It is necessary at this point that we all come to a place in our own relationship, in our own attitude with God, that we are resolved to trust Him, even though we haven't seen the second coming yet. See, Jesus says in Revelation 14 that his end time people, okay, that's us. Uh, believe me, when you're getting old, you know that it's end. It's end. Whether or not it's the, the final end, it could be your end. None of us know that. And none of us should be afraid of that. But being an end time person, an end time people, there are three things that John says will demark, de, de, demark the people of God. Number one, they will be patient. Oh my goodness. I am not patient. So I, I don't know if that disqualifies me right there, but they will be patient. This is Revelation 14. Number two, they will keep the commandments. Oh, how, how I have destroyed them in 2017. And number three, they will have the faith of Jesus. They will have the spirit of Jesus. I like uh, the interpretation that, uh, who's that historian, Chris? George Knight gives that the faith of Jesus is simply love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Isn't that the faith of Jesus? That's the faith of Jesus that I saw when I read the Gospels. You love God, you love his law, and you love your neighbor, and you give them grace just like you want to receive from them. Isn't that the golden rule? Love your neighbor because you want God to love you the same way? My new interpretation of the golden rule. You like it? You know, do unto others, not the one from 2017, do unto others as, you know, you would want them to only do it first. Isn't that the old golden rule? Well, this new golden rule is do unto others as Jesus did. He loved them as his neighbor. So, patient, keep the commandments of God. That's about attitude, you see. You listen to God, you pay attention, you you're in, in a relationship with him. You change your attitude. That's why I'm saying we need a new attitude. And finally, that you have the faith or the spirit of Jesus where you love God and you love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 25 has a number of parables in it. And it talks about 
the big exam, as I call it. And basically, these parables help us to know what it is that we need to be doing, shall we say, in 2018. How, how then shall we live? The great philosopher in 20th century said, how then shall we live? How do we wait until Jesus' second coming? How do we, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this, how do we enjoy this first part of our eternal life? I mean, think about it, folks. You chose to come to church today. Thank you very much. You thought that this was a good idea. I hope you still do, because I'm going to tell you, this memory of being here is an, is an eternal memory. If you believe in eternal life, that this is part of your eternal life, you're never going to forget being here. You'll be able to look back in eons to come when we are in heaven with Jesus and say, you know what, on that New Year's Sabbath, December 30th, 2017, I was at the Santa Clarita Church. I got together with the saints. I got together and I praised God and, and my thoughts and my feelings were joined together with his people on his day. We're going to remember this. This is part of our eternal life. So this is what I'm talking about. This is, this is what I mean when I say this is it. This is what we're doing now in 2017. And I hope that we will start thinking this way in 2018 as well. That we wait. And while we wait, we realize that we are not waiting for something that, that we cannot already experience. We can choose today, my friends, to have a different perspective, to have a different attitude, to have a different resolve, we can choose today to experience the eternal life that Jesus has offered us now and live like that. And that's what Matthew 25 talks about. So I say, stay ready, just like the kids over here. Okay, Stay ready because Jesus is going to talk to you in 2018. And if you're waiting to take that step, Okay, Jesus, what, what do you want me to do? Because I'm not going to make a move unless you say, Jesus says. One step forward. And if somebody else says, oh, go ahead, take a step sideways. Not going to do it. Because Jesus didn't say. Chris and I were talking about this on the way uh, to church today. And we realized, you know, did Jesus have a lot of foreknowledge when he was here on this earth? You ever thought about that? He did say, I don't do anything except my heavenly father tells me to do it. So you see, Jesus was playing, my father says. He was playing, my father says. And he invites us in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day. Doesn't say month. Doesn't say 2018. I'm going to tell you everything that's going to happen to you in 2018, so get ready. No, he says, I'm only going to tell you What's going to happen today? And then he says something audacious like, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough problems of its own. <coughs> so are you putting this together? I, I, I'm, I'm, I tell you what, it's fun for me to put this together. 2018 is going to be this major blast that we're going to live one day at a time with Jesus. Isn't there a song about that? Only they call him sweet Jesus. One day at a time. You know what? He knew that that's all we could take. If we, if he knew, if he showed us what's going to happen in the future, we would probably all ask him to take us out. Don't want to do it. Don't have the strength. Don't have the power. But he invites us, my friends. He invites us to step forward day by day, and he tells us, I'm going to give you the strength and the power, and in fact, I've sent my Holy Spirit to talk to you and to tell you which step to take, when, and how, and with who. He's promised us all of that. So as you face, as you face 2018, I, I, I want to encourage you. Have a new perspective. Enjoy your eternal life in 2018. No matter how long it takes Jesus to come back in our time frame. Because remember, God doesn't count time as humans count time. 
No matter how long he takes to come back, enjoy the fact that we are living our eternal life now in 2018. It's a different perspective, I know, and it's hard to get used to. So it's going to take a new attitude towards our relationship with God, and it's going to take a lot of resolve. And I'm promising you here and now that the Holy Spirit will be the power that makes this happen. So if if you're going to resolve anything in 2018, resolve to let the Holy Spirit rush over you like we sang this morning, like a rushing wind. Amen? Amen.